What happens when you get a bunch of DJs in a room to listen to £33,000 worth of mixers? Well, my name is Mojax, and on this episode of BeatSource Tech, we're about to find out. I hadn't actually planned to do an episode on this, I don't want this series to become the Rotary Mixer Show, but the interest was so high on my social media that I decided it was worth sharing with all of you. Firstly, let's clear up what this event was and what it wasn't. I'd been chatting with the owner of my nearest DJ equipment store, Mike, from Phase 1 in Darlington, which is about an hour from me here in the northeast of the UK. He was in a position which a lot of Pioneer DJ slash Alpha Theta dealers are finding themselves in. They have this very expensive new rotary mixer to sell, the Euphonia, and it's just not quite in their wheelhouse. A lot of these stores, I would guess, have never even sold a rotary mixer before. So he wanted to do some kind of event to showcase it, and I suggested the thing which I'd already told Alpha Theta to do themselves, have a listening session with a bunch of other high-end mixers to allow attendees to get a flavour of how the Euphonia sounds in context with its competition. It wasn't an official Alpha Theta event, but they did send along one of their team to do a quick demonstration of the Euphonia, which was a cool addition. And so that's what the evening was, a listening session. What it wasn't was any kind of scientific test. We set up one Technics Mark V turntable with an Autophon Concord Elite cartridge and a Master Sounds weight. Each mixer was then connected in turn to a pair of RCF Active PA speakers and we played the same record on each mixer, one side of Smooth's Multitrack Reworks Volume 4. We did use a decibel meter to try and get the output to roughly the same for each one to avoid loudness bias, but that was only a rough measurement. We were also in an untreated space, it's a shop, with lots of RF interference etc and the speakers, whilst good quality, could hardly be called audiophile grade kit. We also didn't have much time, with more than 10 mixers to get through and only 2 hours to do it, so no this was about as far from science as you can get. We also didn't get a chance to experience what is a defining factor for many of these devices, the summing quality. It was purely one record at a time and so all we heard was the phono preamps and the overall output. Predictably, many commenters on my Instagram were asking, where was the ENS, or an Alpha, or the Isonoe? Well, I took as many suitable mixes as I could manage from my own collection, as well as review units which haven't gone back yet. Plus, some manufacturers wanted to be involved, so they kindly sent loan units over for the event. I was also very grateful that four attendees also made the effort to bring their own mixes along. So the answer to any where was X mixer question is, we didn't have one. Again, this was a non-scientific, casual event, we weren't trying to do any kind of definitive, objective testing, for which you would try and source those, of course. This was all entirely subjective, based on quick impressions and gut reactions. With all that said, let's talk through what the experience was like. First of all, the euphonia, the reason really that we were there. This was the first time that most people there had got hands on with one and I don't think there was anyone who wasn't impressed. We listened to it first and last to really give it that context and it absolutely acquitted itself very well in the sound stakes. I'd say many attendees may well have chosen one of the other mixers purely based on sound alone, but nobody was arguing that the Euphonia wasn't on a level playing field with the rest. Ultimately, it's a very pricey bit of kit, but it offers much more than any of the other mixers we tried in terms of features, the effects, the digital connectivity, etc., and it does sound great, thanks to the Rupert Neve transformer giving everything that analogue boost. Next up was the Towler 4 from Can Electric, which was brought along by its owner. Cards on the table, I've never liked the look of it with all the connections on the top panel, but everyone agreed it sounded superb. It has a real kick in the low end and overall it just sounded incredibly lively and dynamic. I'm not quite sure what the situation is with their business right now, but I'd definitely be intrigued to hear more from them. After that, we checked out the Eckler Warm 4, and that's where I think the limitations of what we were doing first really became apparent to me. I adore the sound of the Warm 4 on really transparent studio monitors, and I've heard nothing but good reports from owners of it, but on those RCF cabs, it imparted a smooth, enjoyable sound, but just didn't quite have the energy and thrust of some of the other mixers we tried. There's a lot to be said for matching mixers to systems, and this did feel like a bit of a mismatch for sure. We then checked out a mixer I brought along as a wild card, the Omnitronic TRM422. It was the cheapest mixer we listened to by quite some margin, and you know what? It was decent. I think everyone in the room was pleasantly surprised at the quality of the preamps, especially when placed against such ostentatious competition. I've always thought the TRM range is a perfect entry point into the rotary world if you're on a budget, and this event cemented that feeling for me. 
Then came the mixer which, to be honest, was the star of the evening. One attendee brought his Condessa Lucia along and from the second we hooked it up we could all tell it was something special. It's incredibly loud, we had to turn the speakers down in order to drive the mixer levels properly and it just delighted everyone with how alive it sounds. In that respect it had a similar profile to the Towler but just with every aspect cranked up to 11. Huge bass, crisp top end and no sacrifice to the detail in the mids. I've never spent any serious time with a Condessa, them being made in Australia makes reviewing them difficult, but Medi is bringing me a loan unit over to the UK when he visits this summer and based on that performance I just can't wait. The order that we listened to the mixers in was completely random, just based on where they'd been put down in the store, and in the case of the Resor, that did it no favours. As I said in my review, the sound profile they've gone for is all about transparency and resolution, and on the RCF rig it absolutely still delivered that. But listened to directly after the Condessa, with its smack you in the face kind of attitude, the far more refined approach of the 2525FX couldn't help but be a touch underwhelming by comparison. It was still very well received by everyone there though, as I expected. It's a beautiful sounding piece. From there we went on to the Master Sounds 4 Valve Mark II. This got a lot of love from those in attendance, some of that being due to it having a crossfader. Not everyone who wants a rotary also wants to never be able to scratch. But this event was all about the sound and in that regard it also went down very well. The natural harmonic distortion generated by the onboard valve stages may mean it isn't the most accurate sounding mixer out there, but the extra low end warmth they generate was clearly audible and pleasing as we listened, without any loss of detail further up the front frequency spectrum. After that came the Henderson Model X, which while still not cheap is on the more affordable end of the rotary scale, at around half the price of the 4-valve. It was well received on the whole, but like the Resor, its sound profile is intended to be quite flat and so it didn't deliver quite that same level of excitement as some of the mixers preceding it. Overall I think that everyone agreed that, for the price, it is a very solid choice. Someone had kindly brought along their Rain MP2015 and I was really looking forward to checking it out. I haven't heard one for a long time, but sadly there seemed to be something wrong with it. Whether it was due to a ground loop or something internal, we just couldn't get it to stop humming, so I will have to revisit that one another time. Next up was the British Formula Sound FF2.2, one of only two fader mixers in the lineup. Again, being honest, I have never liked the ergonomics or design of their mixers one bit, but this was the personal mixer of Stephen Slater, who is the guy I made my very first rotary video with on the channel, and he loves it, so I kept an open mind. And you know what? It sounded great. It's clearly designed for use on PA systems, not audiophile gear, and so it really shone with the RCFs. Nice and flat, with lots of detail and separation, it was one of the biggest surprises of the evening, and a definite reminder to not judge a book by its cover. We then went to the Master Sounds Radius 4 Mark II, which I currently have in for review, that is, coming soon. I forget sometimes how affordable it is compared with some of the others. It's only around half the price of many of the mixers we tried. It's incredibly well built for the money, and in sound terms, I think out of the ones we listened to in that price range, it got the best reception. It doesn't have the full-on liveliness of some of the others, including its Valve Big Brother, but it sounded very clean and precise. Having reviewed so many lovely sounding mixers since its release, I'd started to second guess my initial assessment of the Play Differently Model 1.4. Did it really sound that good in the phono preamp department? Well, it turns out it did, and still does. It garnered very positive reactions from everyone in attendance with a large, impactful sound that lost nothing in terms of detail. The fader curves are still stupid though. Out of interest, as Phase 1 are Pioneer DJ dealers, we threw the DJM A9 in the mix as they had a demo unit in the store, and it was… okay. Definitely usable for vinyl in a club situation, but not a patch on some of the better mixes we'd heard that evening, or indeed the Euphonia. Everything just sounded a bit more squashed and less airy by comparison. I'd have preferred to hear the DJM V10 as I'm more of a fan of the voicing on that generally, but they didn't have one of those on demo. Then finally, before we went back to the Euphonia again, we checked out the Orbit 6. Union Audio are releasing an isolator and crossfader accessory for it soon, so they were kind enough to send the mixer over early so I could take it to this event. The sound was very well received by everyone, although the price, more than everything else by quite some margin, was hard to swallow for many attendees, as was the rack mount design and the very high resistance on the knobs. It was another one which has a very loud output, we had to turn the speakers down for it again, but the undeniable fatness of that valve sound still really does it for me. 
Did I draw any overall conclusions? Well, a few. Firstly, good quality sound is available at a huge range of price points. From the entry-level Omnitronic to the mixers costing thousands, we didn't hear any bad sound all night. Everyone had their favourites and there were a few surprises along the way, but if you're into playing vinyl there is a decent sounding mixer out there for you, whatever your budget. Secondly, you do need to take real care with how you match your mixer to the rest of your system. Not just your speakers, but things like your cartridges too. And the type of music that you play should absolutely impact your buying decision also. I'd have loved to throw on some more electronic sounds with a few of the mixers that night, as I know that's where they shine more, but that wasn't the way the event was set up. And finally, remember stores? Stores are great. Hanging out in a shop with like-minded people, talking gear, music and life, it was a real breath of fresh air in this internet shopping age. So please do try and support your local DJ equipment store if you have one, especially if they're independent. Not only do the employees usually have years of knowledge and wisdom to share with you, but you can also demo gear for yourself before buying, which is always ideal when you can. Oh, and if you run a DJ equipment store, I would truly recommend doing an event like this yourself. You could run it around the Euphonia as Mike did or just have a listening session or lighting demo day or a turntablist jam, whatever you like. Manufacturers and distributors are always keen to be involved in such things, so it needn't be expensive for you. Maybe you actually do events like that already, in which case let everybody know about them in the comments below. And if you're not a store owner, sound off in those comments about your favourite DJ stores, whether they're still with us or sadly departed. I spent a couple of years working at dex.co.uk in London back in the early 2000s, so that will always have a special place in my heart, for example. Which DJ store has been most significant in your life? Show it some love below. Thanks for watching this episode of BeatSource Tech. I do hope you've enjoyed it or found it useful. If you have, please give the video a thumbs up and make sure you subscribe to the channel and you turn on notifications to make sure you don't miss any future videos. I'll see you next time.